what's your vision of Connecticut in 2035? Well, this morning here on The Real Story, we're talking to Governor Ned Lamont about what he sees changing and how a new program could fund major progress across the state. And ahead of Thanksgiving, we're looking at the native history of Connecticut, how indigenous culture can be kept alive, and why the holiday is seen as an opportunity for indigenous education. Good morning and thanks for joining us here on The Real Story. I'm Emma Wolforst. Voters have elected their new municipal leaders with priorities like affordable housing, child care, job opportunities, and more top of mind. Now, the state is launching a new investment program to fund that progress. Joining me now to talk about it, Governor Ned Lamont. Governor, thank you so much for being here. Nice to see you, Emma. You as well. So Connecticut has struggled for a long time to try and retain residents, and that's it's been a major priority for you to try and keep especially young people and college students either coming back or staying here in the state. We've seen some new numbers come out and Connecticut's population is on the rise. We're actually growing pretty quickly. So as we grow, investments are being made into a lot of different things to, you know, not just maintain this, but continue it. So tell me a little bit about this new financing program and Connecticut 2035. So let's pull the lens back. Yeah. If demographics is destiny. Uh, Connecticut was losing. We For many years, we had young people leaving. The cool kids are all going down to Greenwich Village and Boston and uh, GE left and woe was us. And there was a little bit of pessimism. But the last uh, three years, uh, the moving vans have turned around. Last year, we had about 58,000 people move into the state, coming here from New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey. We were gaining population. They were losing uh, population. And uh, what we're trying to do now is give people a vision of what this state can look like uh, 10, 12 years out from now. And that's what we did on Friday with uh, Connecticut 2035. And do you think it's important for people who are either considering staying or considering moving here from another state to have that roadmap to maybe see yeah. that Connecticut's leaders are looking into the future? Absolutely. And people want to know not just what it looks like today, but if I'm going to buy a house or start a business or start a family, what's going to look like 10, 20 years from now? And I think you saw it at 2035, you have most of the new construction, most of the new housing is being in downtown urban areas. Our cities used to be 30%, 40% bigger than they are today. They're coming back. The cities are coming back to life and transportation is interconnecting them. And so let's talk about where you see Connecticut going in 2035. You know, when we think of quality of life policies, this thing, as you mentioned, like transportation and housing, let's start specifically with housing. Your administration, coupled with federal funding, have made a lot of in investments into housing. We've seen the time to own programs and workforce development housing. But unfortunately, homelessness is still on the rise in a lot of areas and the market is really hard for low to middle income residents. What do you feel is working so far and, and what do you think still needs to be done in that area? I think the only thing that really slows up our opportunity and growth right now is housing. Mm. People don't have a place to live. We need all types of housing. We need workforce housing. We need housing for single people, not just you know, young families in the suburbs, but single people in vibrant downtowns. We need housing so our teachers and farming cops can afford to live in the towns where they are. As you just pointed out, we also need uh, supportive housing. Those are folks maybe coming back from some addiction or mental health issues, a little bit of extra support so they can uh, get back in the game. We need all the above, and we've doubled the investments we've ever made in housing across the board. I think you'll see a uh, real difference being made over the next couple of years. You talked about urban housing. Obviously, as you said, our cities used to be a lot bigger, and that's a lot of times where people want to be and, and want to live. In New Haven, the city created an inclusionary zoning laws, which we've seen a statewide campaign for more of this and more kind of transit-oriented housing. But we've also seen the state mostly stay out of local zoning. How will the Connecticut 2035 program change that and, and do you believe it needs to in terms of the state having an evolve 2035 is what we think the state 
is going to look like, could look like, but that is locally driven. We need okay. each, each and every one of the towns and cities to say, this is where I want housing. This is where I want transit. This is where I want supportive housing. This would be for commercial development. So we can follow your lead and support you with the resources as best we can. And one way you and the legislature attempted to create some state standards and progress was requiring the municipal affordable housing plans, which, you know, is pretty similar to what you're asking for as part of this new 2035 program. But there are several towns and cities that did not present a plan uh, in the past before 2035 and have not really made good on those original goals. So will the Connecticut 2035 be different? Is there going to be some sort of enforcement there to get these municipalities to, to give the it's state these plans? It's more about incentives. I mean, okay. we've got significant resources. We'll follow your lead, but you've got to take the lead. Again, and here we are in Hartford, you know, we have a lot of empty parking lots, commercial buildings that aren't as filled or empty right now. You know, some brown fields. These are all places that are ripe for housing for young people. You know, under Luke Brolin, we had, um, you know, well over a thousand units built, a lot of people moving in. And Aruna, we're going to keep that progress going. I think you see that in cities across the state. Trying to dangle the carrot and give those incentives rather than come in with enforcements or repercussions. That's the way I think about it, yes. And then what about the wealthier towns that, you know, maybe haven't put those plans in yet or don't think that they really need any of those incentives? Are there going to be any conversations with those wealthier areas in Connecticut? Look, I, um, I live right next to West Hartford there in the governor's residence, and that town is uh, vibrant. Yeah. They've got a lot of housing downtown, Blueback Square. I'd say the average age seems to be a lot younger than down in Greenwich, Connecticut, where, yeah. you know, I, you know, started the family. So um, it does make a difference. And I want these towns, even the suburban towns, to think about where they want to be 10 years. Will there be a place for grandparents who want to downsize? Will there be a place for grandchildren who want to start their families and, or even just single people downtown? Okay. And there are a number of state investment wins when it comes to opportunities for people to live here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So let's talk quickly about Career Connect. It's a program you're really proud of. How do you see that making a difference here in the state? We got about 90,000 jobs that uh, we're having a hard time filling right now. Yeah. We got more jobs than people uh, looking for jobs right now. So there's a couple of things we're doing. A, greatest expansion of daycare, childcare ever to allow that single mom or dad to get back into the game, get back to work, know their baby's been well taken care of. Yeah. Uh, we're providing free job training. When I say free job training, in 26 weeks, you could have a skill with a guaranteed job. You know, that's everything from nursing to laser welders to um, teaching, making a difference uh, there as well. Yeah, and, and we've seen the October numbers come out that unemployment is actually the lowest it's been here in Connecticut since 2002. What was your reaction to seeing that data? I'm proud of Connecticut. We have a, our unemployment rate is lower than the national average. It's often not that way, but we got to do better. And I also think these unfilled jobs is really an opportunity to lift everybody up. I want nobody left behind. So anyone who says, that's not really a job for me. Nobody in my family has ever had a job like that in my family. Yes, you can. Yes, you will. We'll provide you the job training. We'll provide you the daycare, the transportation, the housing support to get you in the game. Let's head to, to transportation a little bit. And transit-oriented housing and transportation infrastructure, you know, we're seeing a lot of federal investment to make a lot of these major projects possible here in Connecticut from improving roadways and preventing pedestrian deaths to faster, more efficient railways. We just celebrated the anniversary of the Biden administration's bipartisan infrastructure law. So from your point of view, how are we seeing that federal investment change Connecticut's transportation landscape? Well, first of all, thanks to um Chris Murphy and Dick Blumenthal and our congressional delegation, Connecticut's punching way above its weight class, yeah. significant resources going in. We're going to take a half an hour off that uh, Amtrak from Boston to New Haven, then from New Haven to New York, saving significant time. Yeah. And even our rural areas, more rural transit, we're on your app, we can get you uh, some transportation as you need it. Uh, I think you're going to see that transformed. It's all around major centers of transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, right here in Hartford, what you see down in Union Station in New Haven, really growing up around there so people can get out of their cars and get in the train if they need to to get to work. And I think a lot of people might think, as you said, 
punching above our weight with the federal mm -hmm. delegation. Connecticut's getting a bunch of that federal money, and some people might think, well, Connecticut's such a small state, but it's really kind of this big thoroughfare between major cities like Boston and New York. So why is transportation so important for Connecticut? Because our location is one of our great advantages. And, um, you know, Boston, New York City, great place to visit. Wouldn't want to live there, but I want you to be able to get there back and forth um, quicker if you can. I want you to be able to get from uh, Hartford down to New Haven over to Waterbury a lot easier. People get around, get you out of automobiles and make it uh, a lot more environmentally friendly and affordable for you to get around. Yeah. And two of the state's bridge projects that receive some of this federal funding are some of the most expensive projects to be funded nationally. One of the major reasons is obviously cost of time and labor. And now we have transportation workers union saying the $2 billion toward railway, railways doesn't really mean anything if they don't have the staff to build that and make that happen, especially in a timely manner. You know, what are we seeing on the staffing end in terms of actually trying to get these projects done? If you want to be a transportation engineer, we'll train you, guarantee you a job, really good paying job. You know, this is what we need in this state right now. Uh, you know, pulling the lens back, yeah, a lot of these projects are incredibly expensive, especially when, you know, you have to keep traffic going at the same time you're repairing the bridge. But have you seen how they're doing it now? They do the northbound three lanes off-site, and then they um, crane it right over and put it on. So at exit 17 or 995, they did that bridge in a two weekends. It's extraordinary. And you mentioned environmental impacts as well. What does Connecticut 20... 35 mean in terms of the environment and trying to fight climate change here in Connecticut? It means two things. One, um, if we can get people out of their automobiles, mm -hmm. make it easier for them to get around, maybe work locally, walkable cities, right. bikeable cities. Um, uh, if, you can, if you have to take a rail, get out of the automobile as well. And perhaps those automobiles would be EVs, electric vehicles. You know, we've tripled the number of EVs in the state over the last uh, few years. Let's keep that momentum going. And can the electric grid handle that? When you talk about EVs, there's been a lot of pushback from some people in the state and a lot of concerns brought up about Connecticut's electric grid and how we access our power. Is that something that needs to be a part of that conversation too? Any sort of infrastructure improvements to make sure Connecticut has the power to keep bringing yeah. in more EVs? I mean, we're, we work very closely with Eversource and UI, making sure that load is there. Main thing we're doing is getting a smart meters in. Mm. And that means you'll be able to charge your car in the middle of the night at half the price. That means we're not adding to the peak load. That builds a lot of extra capacity as we continue to build out generating capacity across the state. You know, we're launching the wind power in a couple of years. Yep. Yep. And you've spoken a lot about the reputations that you either know or hope Connecticut will have on a national level from aerospace manufacturing to federal recognition of our gun policies and reproductive rights. As you're looking ahead at what Connecticut could look like in 2035, what do you hope becomes synonymous with the state? Uh, we've just launched Make It Here. And uh, that was because some people think we have a lot of old manufacturing and an older economy. We're saying not at all. We have the most advanced manufacturer. We're the Silicon Valley of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You say insurance, oh, kind of sleepy green eye shades. No, this is fintech. This is the next generation of a uh, risk adjustment. You know, greater New Haven area, more startups in the life sciences and bioscience. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to give people, young people, an idea that this is the most innovative economy in the country. And is there anywhere yet that you feel like Connecticut can still step up, especially with a lot of federal money and investments coming into our state? Um, make sure that nobody's left behind. Uh, I think having those jobs unfilled, provide the training, that's really what I want to do, lift everybody up. Uh, a growing economy only works if it grows for everybody. Yeah, well, Governor, thank you so much, as always, for coming and chatting with us about this. And infrastructure, transportation, housing, definitely important for everyone here in the state. Nice to see you, Emma. Thanks. Yes, you as well. So there's still more to come here, though, on The Real Story. Native American Heritage Month is a chance for Connecticut to reflect on its rich indigenous history. Joining us next is one educator on a mission to not just bring this history to life, but keep the Native tradition alive. Stay with us.